Hey y'all, welcome to Coyote Trapping School, episode number 26. In this episode, I interview Jeff Trainer. He's a trapper, a, a nuisance wildlife trapper, and a fur trapper out of Blanken, I think New Jersey, um, up north. And, and we have a lot of interesting conversation. He's got a kind of an organization called Fur Bear Conservation. And it's all about trying to trying to promote fur trapping and, and the trapping culture in a, in a positive light and back up why and, and kind of combat the antis with um, with data and statistics on why trapping is beneficial and why trapping is necessary and uh, it, it, I really enjoyed the really enjoyed the interview I learned a lot of, and uh, you know it's a different perspective to think of uh, you you'll hear us talk plenty about it but I just I, I think we've got numbers on our side and I don't think that's something that we use a lot of times as trappers and so I, I think that's something that definitely we need to be thinking more about so be sure to uh, listen to the whole thing as long these last couple of interviews have been pretty long I hope y'all are liking that I enjoyed the, the talking and a lot of cases kind of had to cut it off because we could have kept going forever uh, as, as is the case usually when you get some trappers together but uh, let me know what you think and we will uh, see you on the next one all right, so I'm here today with Jeff Trainer from Fur Bearer Conservation. So Jeff, why don't you give us a, a little bit of background on yourself and how you started trapping, and then what exactly is Fur Bearer Conservation? Sure. Well, uh, thanks for having me, Chris. First of all, and uh, yeah, I basically, uh, my name is Jeff Trainer. I'm a trapper up here in uh, New Hampshire. Um, been trapping for just over a decade now. Uh, got my start basically with fur trapping and uh, it wasn't long up here we're, we're pretty densely populated up here in southern new hampshire so it wasn't long before uh, there was a lot of beaver control work peppered in uh, i became heavily involved with nuisance wildlife work um, so now i kind of have a balance between the two um, i'm also a certified state trapper ed instructor um, so I, I wear many hats in the trapping community i also uh, i'm the county i'm a county director for the New Hampshire Trappers Association currently as well. Uh, FurBearerConservation.com is uh, it's many different things. It's it's kind of had different uh, different titles over the years. It started off as LiveFreeAndTrap.com, which is basically a playoff of our state motto, which is Live Free or Die. And it was basically a tongue-in-cheek response to a a lot of uh, heavy animal rights presence that we had growing here in the Northeast, um, a lot of unfair commentary towards uh, trappers and hunters both. Um, so I put a website together, um, started making some really good contacts with a lot of biologists, both locally and nationally. Um, and over time, it start, like I said, it started out kind of mainly an emphasis on trapping. Um, but it wasn't long before I really started to shift direction from just being like a how-to trapping uh, site and advocacy site. It really started to blossom into this conservation-minded uh, website, which is where it became Fur Bearer Conservation, where we focus on the relationships that modern trappers and hunters have um, with conservation and uh, in our state agencies and the wildlife management professionals who are tasked with conserving these resources for not just hunters and trappers but the public in general sure and being in like you said earlier being in new hampshire I, the only things really that i know much about that is you know when they try to do bear seasons bear hunting seasons in new hampshire that all got squashed so i can imagine that you're in the in the heart of the anti-zone in my mind anyway oh sure and it's yeah, it's it's funny you mention that um, because we started off with Maine having a bear referendum uh, through the Humane Society. They were one of the major players, um, and of course all the local animal rights groups. And it just had this cascade effect. You know, Massachusetts, which is right below us, um, they lost a lot of their prime trapping rights uh, throughout the 90s. Um, just frivolous uh, restrictions on a on an important wildlife management tool. And from there, it just kind of festered and blossomed. And uh, whether it be Maine, whether it be New Hampshire, whether it be Vermont, um, even New York you're seeing a little bit now, um, the whole Northeast, man, it seems like we're just really getting hammered lately, um, which is something we've never, you know, with the exception of the restrictions in Massachusetts, in years past, you know, the 80s and stuff, I mean, we've, there's always been undertones, but we've never really seen it like what you would expect from, say, 
California. Um, we, we've never really seen that until recent, the last recent decade. We've just been hammered, and it's it's collected throughout the Northeast. I'd say uh, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, even into Connecticut. Um, we're all seeing those heavy restrictions coming through. Hmm. And so, how is that? So, do you do? Are you a, a damage control and animal uh, nuisance trapper full time? I mean, is that your your? Yeah. Okay. How does? Yeah, how, uh, yeah. I'm basically I, I I do the the nuisance wildlife work. I also work for a regional pest control company, so I kind of got my hands in both four legged and six legged pests. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, I also advocate for the regulated trapping in season trapping. Uh, I'm a I'm a fur trapper during the season when that comes up as well. But it's very interesting that as our population grows here in the Northeast, I'm really having a hard time finding a fine line between you know what you would call quote unquote recreational trapping in season fur trapping versus nuisance work uh, to put it frankly even when i'm trapping for the fur um it's it's all properties that i've been asked to come on uh to do nuisance work of some degree so it's, it all ties in uh, sure. realistically so how was that how was your nuisance trapping when somebody called you and you know in in more of an urban setting do you do both uh, kind of er residential urban types as well as the larger properties or? Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny because I had this picture in my head when I originally started trapping of like that mountain man, uh, rural, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, self-reliant lifestyle. And it really is a self-reliant lifestyle, even if it is in the downtowns of the cities. But um, it's funny. I actually have more success with trapping uh, behind the, the spillways, behind the, the supermarket chains and, uh, you know, the fast food joints, all these, you know, waterways and the outskirts of society. Um, I actually have more results with trapping there than I do in the uh -huh. wilderness sections because I'll, New Hampshire is beautiful in the sense that we can go from a very urban setting. I trap the spillways behind the local strip malls and then 20, 25 minutes out, I'm, 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 I'm setting traps on, you know, 900 acres of land, you know, uh, against the mountains. So um, it's we're very lucky to have that duality here in New Hampshire, where you can go from rural uh, to urban uh, very quickly. And when I say urban, I, you know, for for New Hampshire standards, urban, you know, <laughs> right. you're not you're not talking downtown New York City here, but um, but obviously urban still, uh, nonetheless. Right. So how does when when somebody calls you with with uh you know, an issue, raccoons, beavers, whatever, how do they react? Does, does people always ask you if you're going to kill it or if you're going to relocate it or? Yeah. Oh yeah. And you, 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 it, it's a fine line that you have to play because a lot of people, when you're dealing with a nuisance situation, um, you know, and this is part of the reason why I developed the fur bear conservation think tank, if you will, brand, if you will, um, this website, this advocacy website was to bolster some of this education and kind of give people that other side that they don't tend to really realize too often. But yeah, I get the calls. Uh, someone says, I got beavers, you know, flooding my driveway or flooding my basement. I, they need to be removed uh, for whatever reason. Um, and the, the first thing they ask is, so uh, so where are you going to relocate them to? Right. And it's usually a tough discussion to have with them that um, relocation isn't really always the best choice. It isn't always the right answer, um, especially in a state like New Hampshire where we have laws uh, that basically regulate um, where nuisance wildlife can be dropped off, so to speak. Uh, you have to have written landowner permission for any place you're going to transport nuisance wildlife. Um, and the reason for that is for the disease spread, mainly. Um, sure. If you're, if you're taking an animal, even if, a, say, a skunk doesn't exhibit uh, signs of rabies or distemper, uh, you take that animal and you bring it, you know, 30 miles and reintroduce it to a population, uh, you could be exposing a whole new population to disease issues. But mainly with the focus on beaver, uh, for instance, I can give you an example. Just a couple days ago, I got a call from a landowner who, who wished to have beavers uh, trapped and removed but not killed lethally. He wanted them relocated. Um, and I explained to him that we're in the middle of, you know, December here. Um, we've got ice out on most of our bodies of water. Uh, the survival rate of that particular animal or animals when I relocate them is pretty much nil this time of year. 
Um, so the question then becomes, do we wait? You know, do, you, do they want to wait? Well, meanwhile, the damage is continuing while they try to make this decision. Um, so I always have to express to people that, you know, out of humaneness from the animal that uh, relocation isn't always the best option. I do promote it when the, when the time calls for it. Um, but the reality is that I have a lot of people who call me to remove nuisance wildlife. I don't have that many people who call me asking <laughs> for nuisance wildlife. So <laughs> right, the, right. The relocation aspect is very, very tough here in the Northeast, especially uh, with the habitat loss that we're having. There's just no place for these creatures to go. So, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, I have to have, you know, even when they're asking for, you know, they'll, they'll, they're willing to pay all kinds of money for this from a moral standpoint. I have to sit there and say, you know what, I, I think I got to turn this down because I, I, I don't feel right uh, from a humane standpoint relocating something like that in the dead of winter, whatever the animal may be. Um, the chances of survival are low. We know that. Yeah, yeah as trapper to trapper, we know uh what, what Mother Nature has in store for that regulation. So um, right. you know, there's a level of, of, of humaneness that has to go in with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I think even some states, what people don't realize, like you said, some states won't allow relocation just because not only is it you, you have the disease issues and things like that, but that, that's a whole other added stress on the animal that people don't think absolutely. about. People just think you go and turn him loose and he bounds off happy as a lark and... Yep. Yep. So you said it perfectly. Yeah, that, that's exactly it is that they, they see this animal leaving their property and it's off to a better life. But the reality is, is that it's creating issues not only for the animal, but possibly for other wildlife and somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, the, the reason I kind of reached out to you is, is I saw an article that you wrote recently called Bash Those Lowly Trappers at, their, at Your mm -hmm. Own Peril. And, uh, man, that really struck a chord with me because as, as trapping season has picked up and, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you get, you probably get it worse than I do, but as, uh, you know, being, being a somewhat prominent figure, and I say that very loosely, but on social media and YouTube and the likes and, and publishing trapping related content, uh, you're definitely opening yourself up for, uh, uneducated people to lambast oh, and, sure. and comment and, um, so that's that's something that I've I've struggled with, and and depending on the the comment or the reaction, I'll try to go back and forth with some people. You know, some people are just so far off the grid that uh, I just mm -hmm. block and delete and doesn't pay any attention. But uh, you know, as I as I think through some of these kind of arguments that I'm putting out there, that's just kind of something that I've been thinking about: is how how do we as trappers, when somebody leaves a comment that's not crazy about, I hope somebody skins you. But mm -hmm. they something about I I don't you know I feel like this picture is disrespectful or whatever. How how do we open that conversation and try to steer it in the direction of opening their eyes to what we truly are doing? That we're not out just to kill, but you know we we value these animals and what they provide and and what they are. And you know we it that's a hard thing for people to understand is we, we respect and admire these animals, yet we also try actively daily to kill them. Right. Right. And it's, it's assuming the role in nature. And it's, it's funny that you mention all that because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get a lot of criticism and I, I, I use the term criticism loosely uh, as well, because yeah. some of it is just downright uh, uh, pure evilness uh, towards another human being. I, I sit there and I look at myself and I look at these comments that I get through on, through the internet and through social media and things. And I, I sit there and I say to myself, how can someone who claims to be so uh, passionate for uh, coexistence and, and treating things with respect can talk to uh, another human being like this. Right. But bottom line, the, the bash those lowly trappers at your own peril uh, column that I wrote, it's, it's actually pretty amazing. I wrote that in uh, two nights. Um, it was one of the fastest columns I've ever wrote. And ironically, one of the most widely distributed columns I've had to date uh, from my website. It's just been, it just basically, I guess you could call it quote unquote viral. It just, uh, it resonated with people and, and uh, it just goes to show that I think if you include the facts instead of emotion and y you throw the bullet points in there, um, people want that. There's a, there's a still a group of people out there in the world that want that, which is refreshing because, uh, 
unfortunately, in today's society, we don't see too much of that. We see people that want to uh, strong arm their own opinions. And I, and I try not to, I'm biased, obviously, because I'm a trapper, I'm a conservationist, but um, I try not to strong arm my own opinions in a lot of what I write. I try to present the facts, add some commentary, and let the reader decide for themselves how they want to interpret what I've said. But that particular article, um, for the, you know, obviously uh, your audience, not being that familiar with me, probably doesn't realize I, I was actually uh, given an award by our Fish and Game Department here in New Hampshire, uh, hmm. by our Fish and Game Commission, actually, uh, for some of the outreach I've done, not just with the website, but with trapper education and things like that. And I had a local group of activists who, uh, who spent the part, better part of six months trying to get that award stripped from me. Uh, huh. merely for the, you know, when, when you get down to brass tacks, for the, basically for the fact that I'm a trapper. Right. And that's unfortunate, but uh, I sat there and, you know, you see all these hateful comments, you see all these people talking about, you know, we want to ban this, we want to ban that. Trappers are horrible. There's, there's nothing you are going to say, there's nothing that any trapper is going to say um, to a comment like that that is going to solve it, that is going, they're going to change their minds. Right. Um, when, when you get, when you get people to comment that ugly on things, um, you're just not going to change their minds. So I, I had this little twig break in my brain one night and I sat there and said, you know, I spend all this time and all this effort trying to change people's minds on trapping. You know, for once, I'm not going to change their minds. I'm going to give you a bunch of facts. I'm going to tell you how it is and I'm going to let you roll with it. Because the bottom line, as I state in that column, you, the, these activists think they're punishing trappers with a trapping ban. They're not. You're, not. you're not punishing me. My services, to some degree or another, as long as human population keeps breeding, you're going to need me right. one way or another. Um, ultimately, who's going to suffer? It's going to be the public uh, who has to deal with these nuisance issues with higher taxes and things to pay for these problems when they erupt. Um, and it's going to be ultimately the wildlife because at the end of the day, without any management, you know, there's this new movement growing that says that we don't need humans to manage anything. Wildlife can manage itself. Apex predators can manage themselves. Yeah, they can manage themselves. You know how? Through disease, starvation, you know, uh, predation, right. um, all of those aspects of nature that people turn a blind eye to. And I think the growing narrative nowadays from activists is less animal welfare, uh, you know, animals, we, we want to make sure animals are happy, you know, the Bambi mentality. I think that we've moved away from that, and I think it's more or less we don't care what happens to wildlife as long as humans don't, aren't involved. Right. And I think that's a disservice. I think that's a, a disservice to the conservation community, whether you hunt and trap or don't. I think it's a disservice to the wildlife. I think it's a disservice to the resource, if you want to call it a resource. And I think it's a disservice to our natural world to put on a blindfold and say, let nature take its course. Um, I, I, I find that offensive. And, and I may be in the wrong. You and I may be in the wrong with how we think or, or our trapping activities. But at the end of the day, the science tends to show I'm not wrong, and the facts tend to show I'm not wrong. So that's what I've kind of invested with in the Fur Bear Conservation website is sticking to the, to, to the biology mostly. I mean, I go on my, my tangents, my biased tangents here and there. <laughs> but for the most part, um, I'm going to throw you the facts, and whatever sticks to the wall, you know, you can, you can take it for what it is. But just understand that all of the attacking on me, um, it, it, it's – it's not going to do anything to me. <laughs> I'm right. still going to be needed. Um, right. But you're, you're, you're going to end up destroying the resource. So. so what what would be your opening uh, dialogue with somebody that, that, that sees a picture that you post of, you know, a beaver that you catch, and mm -hmm. they're not at the crazy outlandish, you know, I hope you get caught in the trap and drown, but you know, they, they leave some kind of comment where they don't exactly line up, but, but there may be some potential there to, to have a discussion with them. What would you, how would you rebut that and, and, you know, try to win them over, so to speak, I guess. Where does your food come from? That's bottom line. Yeah. Where did your clothes come from? Where did your leather belt come from? You know, a beaver is, is probably the most widely used 
out of all the fur bears we trap. I mean, the tail leather is used, the tail meat is used. I eat beaver. Uh, the, the meat is comparable to, to beef as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the pelt is used. The skulls are used for education. I mean, there's literally very, very, very little on that animal that does not get used by me. Uh, so bottom line, when, when, when someone has criticism for, uh, for me taking a fur-bearing animal, uh, my first question is, where did your cheeseburger come from? And, uh, and, and bottom line, you know, people who are vegetarian or people who are vegan, um, I have very good friends who are both and who recognize my arguments and uh, we agree to disagree and they respect me and I respect them. Um, but bottom line, vegans and vegetarians, I, I honestly, frankly, don't have much to come by. If you can't recognize eating another animal or using another animal as a resource, whether it be for leather, for hide, for fur, for warmth, for whatever, we're too polar opposites. We're too far apart. I, I just can't offer anything to you other than the wildlife management aspect of things, but a lot of times people will already have their minds made up. Um, so the first thing I usually do is try to feel out whether or not they're, you know, omnivores, first of all. <laughs> yeah. are, they, are they eating meat? Are they eating cheeseburgers? How do they feel about the regulated usage of wildlife? And again, terminology is important. So when we're trapping, it's, it's regulated trapping. I would imagine that your state has laws and regulations just like mine uh, to ensure that the resource is not overtaken or overstressed uh, from trap or take. So we're talking about a regulated activity here. Um, and that's another important concept to keep in mind because uh, the second question I typically would ask them is, do you drive a vehicle? Um, because your vehicle is responsible for one million animal deaths per day, uh, and that's not regulated. Uh, when you run over a squirrel in the street or when you run over a bobcat or, or whatever the case may be, that animal's not being used, and it's also not in a regulated, managed fashion. So uh, vehicle mortalities or habitat destruction from houses, the, there's no discrepancy on the time of year, breeding, whether that animal has young. Um, it's far more reckless. So uh, my basic response is you better get your house in order before you come throwing glass, you know, rocks at my glass house. Sure. Yeah, and that's one thing that I've, I've you know, kind of turned the tables. In. <laughs> and like you said, that some people just have such a, a different mindset. But, uh, you know, talking about vegans and vegetarians, I mean, what they don't also don't realize is that the, you know, that huge corn field or that huge soybean field or that Whole Foods asphalt parking lot used to be mm -hmm. habitat for something. And, mm -hmm. you know, th that stuff is there now. Those animals didn't move somewhere else. Those animals were dead. Uh, and I, right. I try to put that in a little bit nicer terms, but, but, uh, that, like you said, it's, it's tough from somebody with that mindset. It's tough to reason you know that that can't fathom for whatever reason has issues with the killing of of something for for their benefit i guess you could say for an from a, from an animalistic uh perspective i'm a predator i'm an apex predator i'm the apex predator at least if, for the most part in the lower 48 and i don't say that with arrogance i say that uh for the simple fact that let's face it we are Humans are probably, number one, the most invasive species on the planet. And number two, we're an apex predator, man. We, we eat meat. Yep. Um, the fact that we've found ways to ethic, ethically, or as, as some of us believe, to be ethically uh, sourced, um, whether it be with rifle, bow, trap, fishing rod, um, you know, you you got to really have your ducks in a row if you're going to come after that kind of mentality while you're while you're st sitting in the line at McDonald's waiting for your cheeseburger. Right, right. So you mentioned that you're a county director for the New Hampshire Trappers Association. Mm -hmm. Do y'all how? How is the trapping community up there? Is is it are the ranks of trappers growing or or is it kind of stagnant or what's what's the pulse on the trapping community in the Northeast? So we're going through a little bit of a renaissance. I will say that both Maine and and uh, Vermont, which both are uh, bordering, and actually, if you want to get technical, Quebec, which is uh, you know, the Canadian province above us, um, all those three regions, um, they've got a pretty 
heavily seeded uh, trapping and hunting community. Um, I think a lot of that area is still rural, uh, whereas a lot of New Hampshire's rural uh, areas are, let's face it, are White Mountains, which is uh, federal land. Um, trappers in New Hampshire have been on the decline. Um, in the New Hampshire Trappers Association, we're doing pretty well. We're hovering somewhere around 400 members, and that's a that's really off the top of my head, so don't quote me 100% on that number. But sure. um, in New Hampshire itself, we're a uh, grand total somewhere around 600, I think, trappers statewide. And again, you're talking about a state with a land mass of about 9,000 miles. So um, it's, a, it's a relatively small state in comparison uh, to, 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 to some of the other states out there. Take, for example, something like Montana, where you have like such wide open swaths of land. We, we're kind of a little more compacted up here. We're not quite as small as like Rhode Island, but certainly we're on the smaller scale. But where we're seeing a bit of renaissance with our, especially our trapping community, is that we cannot fill our trapper education classes fast enough. Really? The demand, um, the demand is in for trappers. And I can tell you that 90% of the trappers that come through my classes probably will never go on to actually ever set a trap. But the fact is they're curious, they're interested in the activity, they want to know more about the activity, and they want to get it straight from the horse's mouth rather than just listen to what they hear in a letter to the editor or an editorial. Um, so the demand is incredibly high uh, for people wanting to get certified as trappers in New Hampshire. And uh, we have waiting lists. You know, there's only six volunteer instructors in the entire state for trapper education through our fish and game department. So needless to say, the resources are spread pretty thin. Um, we just got some more onboarding with, with a few more uh, people that were interested in teaching classes, so that's growing. But um, but certainly I think it's a little mix of, uh, I think you've got shows like Mountain Men or yep. uh, Yukon Men, which has kind of bolstered uh, an interest in the activity. Um, you've got wildlife control, uh, because in New Hampshire, in order to be a wildlife control or damage control agent, you have to go through a, a trapper ed class first. Um, and then I think you've also got this locavore uh, mentality. People want to know where their food comes from. People want to become more self-reliant. And I think people move to rural places like New Hampshire, um, which is still, you know, let's face it, any part of New Hampshire just mere a few hours from Boston. Right, uh, Massachusetts. So you're still you're on you're still in that rural setting, but you're still close to civilization. And I think people romanticize with that that they can you know have a, a self sufficient lifestyle off the grid, quote unquote, on a you know ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty acre lot, um, but still you know drive down to drive down to the city if they wanted to. So I think there's a locavore movement there that's really kind of promoting some of this. And let's face it, if you're going to survive in the wilderness. You gotta, you gotta know how to trap an animal. It's just the bottom line of things. Um, not everything can be solved with a, with a rifle or a firearm. And let's face it, uh, if you want to really go down the rabbit hole, there's, there's a, a growing movement of preppers, doomsday preppers, or, right. or self-reliant folks. That, um, you know, what happens when you run out of ammunition? You, you got to learn how to snare. You got to learn how to, um, you know, create deadfalls and things like that. All those things I will say are are illegal to use during the first season in New Hampshire. I don't want to plant any ideas in anyone's heads, but, um, but in a survival situation, it's trapping is an important and beneficial thing to know. Um, so I think that, I think that kind of interest is what is, uh, fueling, uh, curiosity with trapping in the 21st century. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Is so is, is the, I guess the fur bears as a food resource, is that pretty well accepted up there or is that still kind of kind of on the fringe? You'd be surprised. Um, I would still call it fringe, yeah. although a lot of people who I would expect to be surprised weren't, <laughs> especially with things like muskrat, uh, beaver, uh, raccoon, possum. Um, some of the normal staples. Um, and as a matter of fact, New Hampshire made national headlines where a distillery, Camworth Distillery here in New Hampshire, actually created the first whiskey with Beaver Caster just this past year. So, uh -huh. um, and it was received with very uh, high reviews. Uh, there was actually a local trapper here in New Hampshire who supplied caster glands uh, to a distillery, and they actually used those caster glands, as you know, 
Um, Beaver Castor historically has been a flavoring agent. It's kind of like a vanilla flavor, uh, if you will, when it's rendered down. And it's been used in all kinds of food preservatives, everything from vanilla um, to perfumes, all kinds of things. So um, that gained a lot of interest as well. You know, a, a, a bourbon that was flavored with quote-unquote beaver butt juice, you know, was the, <laughs> was the national headlines for a couple of months this past year. <laughs> That's interesting because I would say, you know, in the South, we're seeing a lot of interest in trapping too, but I'd say it's more from a uh, a wildlife management kind of standpoint of uh, particularly coyotes mm-hmm. and, and uh, mm-hmm. all the the kind of the research and the, the, I guess, statistics that are showing that coyotes may be having an impact on deer populations, and that's driven a lot of people to take more interest in it. I would still say there's not a lot of people that still – you know, take you serious about eating a, a beaver or eating a raccoon. But. Yep. And, and I got to say that um, with all due diligence, there is a there is a, a growing interest from our deer hunting community. Um, I actually did a podcast uh, a couple months ago on the Big Buck Registry, and they uh, it, it, the big topic was, was obviously coyote and how uh, deer hunters could factor coyote hunting into their uh, into their outdoor pursuits. Um, it's definitely there, and with that comes a little bit of turbulence because, as we know, there is a wildlife management standpoint to it. But uh, it seems, especially in the Northeast here, some of this Midwest wolf stuff has kind of trickled and wafted over, um, and we have a lot of people that are trying to uh, trying to remove wildlife management of predators, and that's going to be something that the Fur Bear Conservation website uh, and my contributors, whether it's me or whether it's my uh, my other contributors and, and resources, um, we're going to be focusing heavily on predator management in 2019 because it's becoming a, a very, very hot topic uh, issue um, with regards to things like uh, the, the theory of responsive reproduction or uh, predators that are maintaining, you know, uh, uh, vermin levels, if you will, rodents, mice, squirrels, that sort of thing. Um, there's this growing movement of people that think that predators, uh, especially apex predators like wolves and coyotes, uh, they can do no wrong. And um, I, I got to say, I, I respect the animal. Um, I think coyotes, uh, you get some guys uh, that just look at them straight as vermin, uh, that, that everyone needs to be, is a dead one. Um, and I, you know, I may not make too many friends with that, with this sentiment, but I, I think that they do have their place um, in a regulated fashion. And, yep. and that's yep. very important to, to point out that uh, I still think there needs to be human regulation on our, on our predators, especially our wild canids. Um, and, and the growing movement to try and remove hunters and trappers from that aspect, from that regulated management aspect, um, is something I'm definitely going to be focusing on in the future. Hmm. Yeah, and that's it's hard. It's hard to imagine anybody thinking, especially with something like the coyote, that that any you know, that the humans could exterminate or extirpate that. I mean, there's been right. such emphasis put on, and and a lot of states in the South, Georgia, my state included, there's no closed season. I can trap coyotes year round, shoot them year round. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're seen as a pest, but. There's nobody nobody making a dent in the in the predator population in Georgia. I can assure you, no matter how hard we try. So, and like you said, I mean, it, what's so hard for people to understand, and, and even uh, you know, like you said, I run into deer hunters and folks like, hey, I'll kill them all. You know, I don't want to see one. And man, I I right. want to I want to trap them next year and the next year and the next year. I I there's nothing that excites me more than than going outside at dusk and hearing coyotes howl around. You know, that's just man that. I love that here, that sound. I love knowing that, that they're out there and, and, uh, I don't know, just something I like about that. Being a trapper, I always equate it, um, to it's one thing to enjoy nature. It's another to assume your role in nature. And, uh, let's face it. We wouldn't know anything about wildlife, whether it be our fur bears, whether it be our predators, whether it be coyotes, whether it be, you know, muskrats, um, we would not know anything about these animals if it weren't for people historically um, pursuing them and working with the, the science community, um, turning in tissue samples, uh, continued conservation efforts. Um, look, I just, as a trapper, people say, how can you, you know, how can you want to trap? You must love just killing. And 
uh, you know, not only is that an over-the-top statement, but just look at it from a naturalist standpoint for a second. I'm just assuming, my, I'm inserting myself into nature rather than observing it from behind a, a velvet rope. There's only so much that you can gain from a hiking trail versus uh, getting your hand, you know, elbow deep underneath those creek banks from for, for mink or whatever the case may be. So um, I don't look at it as a consumptive, just a taking of wildlife as much as it's assuming the role. I don't, my traps aren't always full, you know, some, every dog has a day and uh, sometimes I'm successful in catching an animal and sometimes the, the animal is successful in, in catching me, if you will. Yeah. So um, it's it's assuming that role in nature. So when you describe, you know, the the coyote howling and things like that, it's uh, we're all part of these grand cycles. And uh, I think that the hunter and the trapper, uh, the ethical ones at least, um, want to assume themselves in that role rather than just observe from from a book or something. Yeah, and that's you know that's one. I had some comments recently about a a picture of a picture that I had of me behind a trap coyote that I posted and. Um, you know, somebody commented that, that, uh, how could I be so disrespectful and, and just kind of carrying on. And, and I replied back and I said, you know, to me, I absolutely respect that animal. And that's why I, I want to get my picture taken with it because that animal could have stepped anywhere else, but mm-hmm. I got him to step right where I needed him to step. Like I'm super proud of the fact that I was able to catch that animal in a trap, whether I release it, as I sometimes do, particularly with like red foxes, female red foxes, I tend to release them or, you know, young of the year or whether I take it home with me. I, I'm incredibly proud of that. And I, it doesn't get anywhere with, with those kind of people, but that's, I don't know. Like you said, it's. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's definitely context there. Um, in recent years, I've, I've forgone, the, the whole notion of, of, uh, of, uh, of taking uh, pictures uh, with animals. I, you know, I just had too many people steal my social media images and, 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 and twist it and take things out of context. Um, and I think that's the big issue with social media. I think especially Facebook and, and that sort of thing, it's just a, it's just a fungus. Um, and it, the problem is that people don't have any context for what you're doing. So when they see you standing behind that coyote, uh, they're not seeing someone, you know, who, who's just standing there with a picture of a coyote. They're seeing the coyote's tail tucked between his legs, or they're seeing, you know, the the chain taunt on the on the trap or something, and they they're assuming uh, that the animal is 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 in pain, first of all, and, and they're assuming that it's it's being taken lightly that a an animal's life is being taken. And, and the reality is that the traps that we use, let's face it, you know you handle these traps on a regular basis just as much as I do. Uh, the same traps that you use to catch your, your coyotes are, are used by biologists uh, for radio collaring studies. Uh, for example, up in Maine, they used foothold traps to catch endangered lynx, radio collar them, and then track those animals because the foothold trap was regarded as the most humane uh, and effective piece of equipment to do that job. Now, I highly doubt uh, that Maine uh, fish and wildlife and biologists would be getting grant funding if there was a bunch of three-legged lynx running around the woods right. from chewing their feet out of traps. And this is the problem with social media is that those images, again, we know what it means, but there's a whole group of people out there that they don't understand that the animal is going to be worried and concerned or are obviously high stress, whether it was in a foothold trap, whether it was in a cage, uh, whether it was uh, restrained in any fashion. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the animal's in pain. Um, and that's, that's something that I don't think we're ever going to win that battle. And that's, and that's right. why I've, I've, I've frankly just decided, you know what, uh, I'm removing that aspect from my advocacy because it's just an uphill battle um, I, I, I'm, I'm one of the strongest people to say I don't think we should censor ourselves. I don't think, um, you know, that we should feel badly or guilty about certain aspects of what we do. But at the same respect, I think that there's no way from a picture for you to explain um, what that situation is. And, and all it's going to do is just bolster uh, donation funding for an organization or an activist group that frankly doesn't deserve it. Um, and the way I look at it, 
I'd rather hit them with my facts. I'd rather hit them with my information. Um, and that's something that they can't twist. That's something that they can't misinterpret from me. Um, and so far, it's been paying off. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 your stuff, obviously, um, I'm not too concerned about. But there are trappers on social media um, that have no tact. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, they just go way overboard. And some of it, uh, you know, I give them a dope smack up beside the head and say, you know, what, what are you doing? Um, you know, that's, that is disrespectful to the resource, to the animal. Um, my first, my first inclination, um, is, is to, to take care of business when I'm trapping, uh, and make sure that the animal welfare is there. And then I'll, I'll document my, uh, my, my activities in the woods after the fact, uh, the animal's welfare is the, is the first thing I'm looking at. And unfortunately there are some hunters and trappers that think that by posting the stuff that they're they're getting back at the activist crowd that they're somehow, um, you know, getting one over on these people or thumbing their noses. And in reality, all you're doing is, is kicking us in the crotch as a, as a group. Um, so if, if any of your listeners could gain anything from that, it would be watch what you post and, 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 and keep it tasteful. We know what it means. We know what you're talking about. But some things, frankly, are just m- more geared for, for private conversation in, in circles that understand what's going on. That's right. That's right. And that's and that's one of the things in having some, some of those kind of back and forth lately is uh, I've put more thought into that. And I haven't posted any, uh, any more pictures so far of, you know, uh, a live animal like that with me in there. But trying to think about how I can a different way, a different pose, whether it's the animal dispatched and, and me looking at it that way or something to where it it may maybe strike a different chord or maybe doesn't get somebody as fired up as that animal alive. I still, it's always a, a balancing act and you never can please everybody. But just like you said, I mean, there's definitely, you know, things that we can all think about and try to do. I mean, I always, you know, look at the foot at, before I post a picture. I look and see because, I mean, we know as as trappers that occasionally it's not something that we want, but occasionally a foot gets cut, a leg may get broken, something like that. And so I'm definitely always look at that. And if, if that's that's something I, I don't try to be extra cautious on on not putting anything like that out because we don't we don't need anybody else. We don't need to hurt ourselves anymore. And and that's the thing. I, I you know I. For a while, I was at the point where I was building a how to trap and a trapping advocacy website. And, um, you know, after a while having an internet presence, I kind of came to the determination that there are plenty of other excellent resources out there uh, for how to learn how to trap. And let's face it, if you're going to learn how to trap, um, you got to see animals in traps. It's just the reality of what we're doing. Otherwise, you, there's no way for you to educate someone how to ethically and humanely catch an animal if you're not showing, <laughs> you know, animals right. in traps. It's just the reality of what we're doing. Um, but I, 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 I realized, you know, not too far into this whole uh, journey that I've taken with fur bear conservation, I realized that um, I'm, I'm, my interests lie less with the how-to I save that for my trapper ed classes. There's, like I said, there's plenty of people like yourself and uh, and some of the other folks in the trapping community who have an online presence, which is you know respectful enough uh, to, to to give new trappers what they the exposure they need to learn how to trap. With me, it's more or less the psychological aspect of uh, of where trapping stands in the modern age and how important from a conservation standpoint the activity of trapping is still heavily heavily needed that's really where my focus has been directed um, and I guess that's why I I'm a little more uh, conservative if you will with with um, with imagery and things like that I mean like I said I I would show you know beavers that I've trapped line them up on the tailgate this is what we got for today this was day five on the trap line yada 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 and it's like man they just somebody steals your image for the hundredth time, you're like, <laughs> really? I've, I've had enough of this. You know what? Right. Instead, I'm gonna beat you, instead, I'm going to beat you at your own game. I'm going to put together a column like Bash Those Lowly Trappers, and uh, and I'm going to beat you that way. And uh, and that's something that can't be twisted. So that's that's kind of where I've gone with it. That's 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 my perspective up here on my, on my little hill. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's a good 
I think that's a good perspective. That's never something that I really put forth a, as an, an argument or, or in conversation. But, uh, you know, how you, you gave the example of the, the Massachusetts when trapping mm-hmm. was banned in Massachusetts and the beaver population exploded and all of a sudden people are calling on trappers to, to remedy their, their beaver issues and the beaver damage. Mm-hmm. Um, or foxes in, uh, was it California? Yep, banning of the foothold. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And that, now the, and that was a that was a ma- an amazing aspect because that showed right there that we had conservation organizations on our side. So when you think of something like uh, a group like the Audubon Society, your first instinct is ah, they probably hate hunters and trappers. They're, you know, they're one of these eco groups that, you know, just wants to save everything. But in reality, they even recognized. In the 1990s, they recognized the need for wildlife management, especially on predators, because their their uh, least terns and and uh, a few other bird species, Caspian terns, I think, were one. Uh, I've got them all in the article there, but um, the uh, the clipper rail was a prime example. The clipper rail was getting wiped out by by red foxes in California, and and then the legislature turns around and wants to put forth a trapping ban by outlawing the foothold trap, and it's just mind-boggling to me Uh, it's a very close minded uh, view to sit there and say well we want to protect wildlife so we need to ban hunting and trapping okay but understand that by banning hunting and trapping you're actually you know causing this this cascade of issues Um, and that was one of those situations in california was that their endangered bird species were just getting wiped out by by foxes and it's still, to this day, I have found no data to show uh, that those endangered bird species are in better shape today than they were. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that, you know, across the U.S. and different, it may not be as public as those things, but I know along the Georgia coast, and I'm sure most of any of the other eastern seaboard where they have turtle nesting grounds or sea turtles nest there, you know, raccoons and recently hogs are a heavy predator of sea turtle nests so they got there's mm-hmm. programs in effect whether it's the state dnr or the uh, fish and wildlife service or the park service they got programs in effect to to maintain and handle the the predators in those situations as well so i think that's a that's a really interesting and vital part that, that we don't always think about when we're trying to defend trapping um and I, th- and I think that's something that's going to come into play a little bit more. We have, um, you're, you're obviously very familiar with carrying capacity, how many animals a particular swath of land can sustain. Yep. Um, but there's also the concept of cultural carrying capacity, which is how many animals the public, which face it, let's face it, the public, whether you're anti or pro, uh, it's hunting and trapping, the public calls the shots on wildlife management for the most part. Um, but the cultural carrying capacity is how much wildlife or, or how many animals society will will tolerate. So that's that's the big duality here. And one of the primary examples I tried to put right in somebody's face was you're taking uh, an enjoyable resource. You're taking an animal, let's just say beavers, for instance, or, or foxes. You're taking a beautiful resource and you are turning it into a pest yep. when you stop managing because again, it's 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 fight or flight. It's it, the uh, nature knows no bounds but survival, and and that's the problem is that these these animals are going to adapt. They're going to do what they need to do, and and at that point, uh, you think pest control companies are really concerned with the pelt or the meat of a beaver? No, they get a they get a call in Massachusetts for a beaver issue. They're wiping them out, whether it's spring, summer, fall, winter. It doesn't matter, man. Yep. And that's the problem is that I'm really one of the biggest drivers that I'm trying to pull, and, I, and again, as a pest and wildlife control guy, like I, I stand to benefit, I guess, <laughs> right. from something like that. You would think I would jump ship and just jump in with these activists and, and support all this because then I'll be able to increase my prices tenfold. But but the bottom line is that uh, I want wildlife to be here for my children to enjoy, for the, for my grandchildren to enjoy, for my great-grandchildren. I, I want the wildlife to stay here in a sustainable fashion. And I have bought in to the idea uh, that regulated wildlife management through hunting and trapping benefits that concept. Um, you can tell me I'm wrong on that. You can tell me that your science shows otherwise. But um, 
as my website proves, I've got plenty of data and information to show that uh, these concepts do um, uh, support uh, biodiversity long term. Yep. Well, and, and just in thinking about it off the top of my head, you know that some of the, the areas, probably up in your neck of the woods, some of the townships and things where they've banned deer hunting, and now mm -hmm. they're they're either using the USDA wildlife services or, you know, local SWAT teams or whatever. They're paying people to come <laughs> in and shoot deer, whereas, you know, you've got somebody that's that's ready and willing to provide this free service, pay the state to do it, and exactly. and then use use that resource, and uh, it, we're too people are too short sighted to see how that's how that's going to impact. It's things. amazing. It's amazing that that's where we're at in 2019. That people still can't see the forest for the trees, and I and I blame that partly on a on a society that is drifting farther and farther away from nature. Um, here up in the Northeast, we are seeing. Uh, habitat loss and housing development like you wouldn't believe. And it seems like everybody that moves here, first of all, wants to close the door behind them. But second of all, right. um, they want to see bears on their back deck. They want to see uh, 50 raccoons feeding on the chicken wings they're feeding them in the, in the backyard. Um, they want to see moose browsing on their rhododendrons in the front yard. Um, and unfortunately, Nature is not a petting zoo, and, and, and that's, I think that's the bigger um, issue that's, that's going to take place here. Uh, banning trapping or banning hunting, uh, that's an issue in and of itself. Um, but this mentality that uh, wildlife is a petting zoo, that nature is a petting zoo, and that we can have wildlife show up on command for us to take pictures with our cell phones, uh, these are all issues that I think are, are coming to the forefront. These are all things that are coming to a head right now nationwide. Um, you know, we've got people that, would, that, that, that just don't have the concept that things go bad. And, and I don't think it's necessarily that they don't get it. I think for 90% of the public that is a, against these activities, I think the problem is that they don't want to get it. They don't right. want to admit that you have to kill, you have to uh, manage in, in order to have healthy populations. Um, and, and people come up with all kinds of science to show that, you know, they don't, we don't need that anymore. But bottom line, everything that I've found, at least in that aspect, has been pseudoscience and, and just uh, can, be, can be traced back to just nonsense. Um, and that's, that's where we're going to be here, I think, in, in 2019 and going forward. I think it's going to be a I think it's going to be a point where people need to see the forest for the trees, whether it's us telling them or, or them seeing it for themselves uh, with rabies calls. I just did a report on rabid bears. And how many rabid bears do you, <laughs> do you hear about across the country? It hmm. seems like it's increasing in, in the 2000s here. And, you know, as, as we creep up and North Carolina just had their first case of a rabid bear. Um, that's telling you that, that, you know, rabies is a density dependent disease. You can be against hunting, you can be against trapping, but you can't deny the fact that rabies is based on density of the population. And this is happening as states like New Jersey are banning bear hunting. Right. You know, uh, you just can't make this stuff up. And unfortunately, I think we need to ha see a crash in our wildlife for people to get it. We need another Massachusetts trapping ban, unfortunately, for people to realize that you need it. I mean, you wouldn't believe the people I talk to from Massachusetts now, legislators who were actually 100% in support or caused uh, the legislative trapping bans in, in Massachusetts throughout the 90s. And they come to me now and I have these discussions with them and they're like, it's the worst thing we ever did. I wish we could take it back. Huh. I, I, I've had legislators from Massachusetts tell me that at trade shows. Um, so that just puts it in perspective that you know, it's it's something that it's not just me wanting to protect trapping, you know, feeding people's heads with this nonsense. This is legit stuff. <laughs> it's history repeats itself. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it, it, it seems like the the crux of it is people are people are uncomfortable with the killing. People are uncomfortable. Yep. They're fine going to the grocery store and buying their meat. But if you give yep. them a gun and say, there's your cow that they they can't stomach that, you know, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's, to me and you, it's killing, regardless of whether you paid somebody at the grocery store to kill it or not, but, right. but. 
and that's the problem is that um and I, I don't fault people who have a problem with killing. That's why they make grocery stores. Um, that's why they make hunters. You know, sure. So we can provide for the people that don't. Um, I don't want to knock that aspect, but here's where you really get my attention. It's one thing to sit there and say, uh, I have a problem with killing. I don't think I can do it. It's another to say, oh, and by the way, I don't think you should either. Right. <laughs> now you're affecting my life. Now you're affecting... Uh, my self-reliant lifestyle because at the end of the day that's really uh, the wildlife management wildlife control aspect of trapping is uh, it is what it is it's a job um, it's a problem solving job which is why I enjoy it um, but at the end of the day my interest in my advocacy for regulated trapping is the fact that it is a self-reliant lifestyle it's a culture base of people and the trappers I've met the women children men uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, ambulance drivers, construction workers, legislators, you name it. Uh, the people who trap are, uh, are both, for the most part, in my circle, good people. And um, it's culture based that I want to support. And uh, my, my right to self-reliance, quite frankly, if you want my honest opinion, a, a right to self-reliance and nourishment trumps even our own constitution. Right. It's, a, it's a natural right, you know? Yep. Yeah, we'll see. And it's, it's funny how people's opinion changes. Like you said, with the with the beavers, or one thing that comes to mind for me is the coyotes, and particularly the urban coyotes. And you see, you know, a, a coyote comes and and takes somebody's cat or dog, and then all of a sudden, they, their mind changes on how precious those coyotes are. But uh, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't. People don't realize that until it directly affects them. A lot of times. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, that's that's the thing is that, yeah, I mean, I guess there's not a lot of people that eat a coyote per se. I know there's people that do. Uh, Steve Ranella can hook you up with, uh, with <laughs> yeah. that information if you're interested because he's done it. Um, but then again, you can't eat a skunk either. Um, does that mean that the skunk shouldn't be managed for the distemper, for the rabies vectors, uh, for the urban issues that skunks uh, create? Um, again, this is a situation where you, you, we've got to kind of weigh our options here. Um, the skunk died if it dies humanely uh, and, and the, the animal is used in an ethical fashion. Um, I'd much rather that than, than have us out there just uh, frivolously killing because, uh, because a township needs it done. You know, that's so, right. Um, that's right. Or like you said earlier about one of, the, one of the arguments that I've gone back and forth with people about is is uh to me it's more it's more respectful to that animal more honoring to that animal if i can use it for something if i can harvest it in a season and and use it for something than it to rot and get run over and everybody hold their nose as they drive by it because they don't right i mean nobody nobody thinks two seconds about driving by a dead skunk or a dead fox or a dead anything on the side of the road but right when you when you show somebody that's actually killing it or that's you know when you have it a picture of it in its in its pristine territory that's what that's what evokes emotions and that there's such a disconnect there yet again of and it's uh, in 2019 at this point uh, I may be right I may be wrong but I've decided uh, to go the way of you know what? I'm going to pick my battles. <laughs> yeah. At this point, I'm done. I tried early on uh, to, to, to kind of educate every single person that had criticism for me. And after a while, I just sat there and said, this is just getting, you know, the, these comments are just getting dumber and dumber. And at some point, you got to sit there and say, you know what? I'm going to pick my battles. And, uh, you know, I'm just not going to engage with you. Here's uh, here's a scientific study on why trapping is beneficial. You can, if you don't like it, you can go talk to uh, your state agency. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much where I'm at at this point. That's know? right. Talk to the bio, talk to the biologists who uh, who support these activities for for the benefits that they promote. Um, because realistically, it's ironic that the trappers and the hunters uh, we get most of the flack. When in reality, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the science. Um, and, and I don't fault the biologist because science falls where it falls. Uh, you know, the chips fall where they may in scientific study. So, um, you know, don't, don't shoot the messenger is basically what I'm trying to say. You know? Right, right. <laughs> 
Well, Jeff, I don't know. You have any anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? I feel like uh, we covered a lot of topics, and that was we hit on exactly what I was wanting to hit on. So I, I definitely enjoyed it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, again, I I thank you for having me on. Um, I, I thank you for the for the outreach and uh, the advocacy that you do, and uh, hopefully we can collectively nationwide and and even internationally as trappers um, can cohesively get to a point where we can. Um, we can all stand and, and, and promote the activity for the conservation benefits for the past. That's right. That's right. So furbearconservation.com, which is an awesome, yes, I don't know if you've got some programming background or, or what, but that is a very nicely put together site. I'm very <laughs> I, impressed. I appreciate that. As somebody that, that has a website and struggles with how to keep it nice and looking halfway decent, I, I you did a, do a very good job on yours, I have to say. I may or may not have some marketing background. Let's <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. But on on uh, Instagram, it's still Live Free and Trap. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And then Facebook? Yep, you can go to Fur Bear Conservation uh, on Facebook. And actually, if you search Fur Bear Conservation on Instagram, I think it'll, my handle's still live free and trap, but I think Fur Bear Conservation pops up. Um, I gotcha. So okay. yeah, you can be find me on Facebook uh, with Fur Bear Conservation, or uh, you can even uh, hit me up on my uh, Twitter handle, Fur Bear Conservation, Trapper603 on Twitter. Um, so that, uh, I'll ask that you, we'll, we'll run down a rabbit hole real quick. I've never, never done Twitter at all. Is there a lot of trapper interaction on Twitter or what, is that just uh, something you've always done? There's not a lot of trapper interaction. There's certainly trapper, uh, trappers on Twitter. Um, it's definitely more geared towards words, uh, right. and link sharing over imagery. Um, I will say what what Twitter really benefits us for um, is number one politics. Every legislator, every House representative in your state, uh, your towns, uh, pretty much everybody has a Twitter handle now. So it's really hmm. nice to be able to tweet out, uh, you know, we disagree with this bill because of this or whatever. Um, but the other thing I'm noticing too is that uh, Twitter is very beneficial for the biology aspect. Uh, of trapping and hunting. Um, there's a lot of biology students on there. There's a lot of wildlife management professionals on there. A lot of wildlife management agencies are on there. Uh, Roland Kays comes to mind, who's a canid uh, biologist, scientist. Um, so, yeah, I use my Twitter my Twitter stuff to basically uh, keep an eye on the, on the legislative aspects as well as the science aspects of, of, of what we do. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, before we we sign off, what's one one tip that you've got for somebody interested in trapping or a, a beginner trapper? What would you say is is one uh, your parting word to the beginner trapper as to how to move forward? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go with the old adage of set on sign. There you go. That's a good one. That's a good one for sure. <laughs> well, Jeff, I enjoyed it. I appreciate you appreciate you coming on. And uh, man, I'd like to I'd like to talk again soon. If you have any 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 developments or any big happenings in 2019, keep us posted. I certainly will. Uh, I don't expect myself going anywhere anytime soon unless the, uh, the, the antis come after me. So uh, <laughs> I expect to be around for a little while. And, uh, and likewise, uh, if you uh, feel free to throw any bones my way if you got any. And uh, uh, I really, again, appreciate you having me on. And, uh, and good luck to you as well. An excellent, uh, excellent show you got there. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We'll do it again. Very good, sir.